Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you Joseph Cotton in Young Mr. Disraeli on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark brings you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories and presents as your host one of the most distinguished actors of the American theater, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Lionel Barrymore. You know there are times when a worn-out expression, an overworked cliché is still the best way of saying something. Well, now, that's why I'm not going to make an apology when I say of Benjamin Disraeli, truth is stranger than fiction. If by some magic we could be carried back to the England of 125 years ago, I doubt that any of us would have dared predict that this humble young law clerk of foreign blood, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, eh, would one day rise to the highest office in the British Empire. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we hope to give you some idea of the drama, the romance, and the driving genius of this man as he steps from the pages of Ellsworth Thane's fine book called Young Mr. Disraeli. And on hand tonight to star in that role, we have a good friend of mine, Joseph Cotton. And now here's Frank Goss from the makers of all my cars. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the card you want to send. Because Hallmark cards are designed to say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it, with the good taste you demand of anything that bears your signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean you cared enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical Because You're Mine, starring Mario Lanza, Doretta Morrow, and James Whitmore. And now here is the first act of Young Mr. Disraeli, starring Joseph Cotton. on the office door listed them all. Mr. Swain, Mr. Stevens, Mr. Maples, Mr. Pierce, Mr. Hunt. Solicitors all. Inside, the young secretary to Mr. Maples leaned back on his high stool and gazed dreamily at his reflection in the ancient wall mirror. The face which looked back at him was strangely foreign. The eyes dark and large, the hair swirling about the forehead in heavy curls, the secretary adjusted his flowing tie and smoothed the collar of his velvet jacket. Mr. Disraeli. Mr. Disraeli. Uh, yes, Mr. Maples. Will you step into my office, please? Yes, sir. Close the door, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Disraeli, I believe I asked you to write a letter to Mr. Smythe about his estate matter. I did, sir. I put it on your desk for your signature. Yes, I have it here. Did you read it over carefully? No, sir. Then I suggest you do so right now. London, May 14th, 1824. Dear Mr. Smythe, in response to your favor of the 10th inst... Go on. There is a sunny garden in the world, the azure flowing of a glorious river between green banks of vine enamored hills crowned with gray towers. Mr. Disraeli... I, I'm sorry, Mr. Maples. I meant to write the poem on another paper. Disraeli, we took you into our firm because your father requested it. He wished to help your career. But now, after three years, I can only conclude that... 
You are what you are. A complete failure. Oh, thank you, sir. What? I thank you in behalf of the sack which you are giving me and in behalf of my future readers. Your, your readers? Yes, sir. I'm going to write books, articles, speeches, poetry, everything. Someday I may even find a rhyme for Messrs. Swain, Stevens, Maples, Pierce, and Hunt solicitors. <laughs> Two long years of writing, and for what? Were you talking to me, Ben? Just to myself, Sarah. Have you read this review of my book? Yes. The critics are so very wrong, Ben. Are they? I, I expect my sister to be prejudiced. Really, I'm not, Ben. It's a wonderful book. I suppose... I suppose if I hadn't poked fun at so many names in high society... But that's why everyone is buying the book, darling. You're a sensation. Mm. Edward Buller told me that, too. He said he wished one of his novels would make such a stir. You see, listen to your friends, Ben, and sit down and write another book for your enemies. Yes, why not? Book after book. I'll make them read me, even if they hate me. I'll make England smile at itself, and after that... Yes, Ben, and after that... I'll travel. I'll see the world and learn. Matt said I'll learn in order to write even better things. <laughs> Constantinople, January 11th, 1831. Dearest Sarah, fortunate girl, you are now sister to the man who has talked and walked with the Sultan of Turkey himself. I am learning, dear Sarah. I know a bit about the world now, and I think of England's place in it. Cairo, Egypt, May 28th. My dear father... I have just returned from the Suez Canal. It's a pity that England shows no interest in this vital waterway. But perhaps one day she shall. Yes, she must. <laughs> Gibraltar, August 19th. Dear Bulwer, I'm homeward bound at last. When we meet again, do invite me to another of your brilliant dinner gatherings. I'm starved for all the talk of literature and politics. Dizzy, I said it's me there. Edward Bulwer. I knew it had to be you. No one else would dare appear in the streets of London with a Turkish walking stick and a fez. Well, it's magnificent to see you again. I want to hear everything that's happened. Well, I should be the one to ask that, is he? Well, let me see. Well, I have an idea for a new novel. I'm going to call it Last Days of Pompeii. Excellent. Uh, what else? Oh, also, I'm, I'm now a member of Parliament. Hmm. Hmm. Well, you don't seem very pleased. Oh, I am, yes. It's just that... Uh, well, I'm confused and alarmed over the political situation. Even at Gibraltar, we had the news that the Duke of Wellington was being booed in the streets. Imagine that, England's greatest hero. Well, there's worse still. Mobs are storming and burning the factories. There's even open talk of revolution. The crown? Oh, William IV's an old man, the heir apparent's just a sheltered girl. It's beyond the crown's control. Reform is in the air. Reform? Yes, we must have it, but... We must never forget that national character is fashioned by history and institutions and... To destroy a nation's institutions is to destroy its life. Dizzy. What's the matter? Why, you've suddenly grown up. Yes, and we need men of your sort. Your place is with me in Parliament. No. No, listen to me, Dizzy. There's to be a by-election at High Wycombe. If you stood for election... Well, I... I'm a writer. And so am I. And an MP, too. Dizzy, promise you'll try. All right. If nothing else, I'll try. <laughs> Dizzy, they, they've just finished counting the vote. I know. I saw the tally sheets. I am sorry, old man. At first, I didn't think it was going to matter to me, but now I realize how very much... Oh, Bull, I'm a failure again. Are you? No. No, you're just ahead of your time. Come on, Dizzy, let's go back to London. You see, there's a party tonight at the Wyndham Lewis's. And they've asked me to bring along that brilliant failure. <laughs> Mary, 
my dear. Yes, Wyndham. I want you to meet your favorite author, Mr. Disraeli, my wife. If I am your favorite author, Mrs. Lewis, then you are my favorite reader, and certainly the most beautiful. Oh, how wonderful. Mr. Disraeli, you sound like a page from one of your own novels. Tell me, there's a line of yours which I admire but can't quite recall. It begins, fate, destiny, chance. Fate, destiny, chance. A particular and special providence. Idle words all. A man's fate is his own temper. That's it. But do you believe it, Mr. Disraeli? Until this evening, I should have replied implicitly. But tonight proves there is a special providence. <laughs> Good heavens. Well, this is too enigmatic for me. Will you excuse me, my dear? <laughs> yes, of course. You mustn't mind my husband, Mr. Disraeli. As a member of Parliament, his life is one continuous enigma. <laughs> but now there must be someone here tonight that you particularly wish to meet. There is. Uh, Lord Lindhurst. Lindhurst? But why? Because he's 60 years old and yet drives about with a full-grown tiger in his carriage. Oh, he's such an eccentric, isn't he? As a symbol of England today, madam. England rides with a tiger which may devour her. Mr. Disraeli. I'm quite serious. England must control its savage elements. She must bring order into her affairs. Because the world needs an England calm and powerful. Uh, Mrs. Lewis? Yes? I uh, overheard your young friend. Uh, would you introduce us, please? Of course. Lord Melbourne, may I present Mr. Disraeli? How do you do, sir? I agree with your wish for England's future, Mr. Disraeli, but such vehemence makes me curious about another matter. Yes, sir? What future have you planned for yourself? What do you want to be? I want to be Prime Minister. <laughs> well, I mean it not as a boast, sir, but as a prediction. It's said that you will soon be Prime Minister yourself, Lord Melbourne, but after you, perhaps long after, I say that... I shall be Prime Minister. When England needs me, I shall be waiting. In a moment, we will return to the second act of Young Mr. Disraeli, starring Joseph Cotton. Remember how you promised yourself last year that this year you'd choose the Christmas card you want him printed with your name early and avoid a last-minute rush? Well, tonight I want to remind you that it's time to put that good resolution to use. By ordering your Christmas cards now, you can have them in plenty of time for leisurely addressing. And before you decide on the card you want to represent you or your family, I suggest you do this. Browse through all the cards in the Hallmark albums at your favorite store. Believe me, the 1952 Christmas collection is bigger and more beautiful than ever before. There's the Hallmark Gallery Artist Series with paintings by Grandma Moses, Norman Rockwell, Winston Churchill, and other top-ranking painters. And a host of sparkling traditional and modern styles, too all ready to send Christmas in an envelope to friends and loved ones everywhere. Yes, you can count on it. You're sure to find that one perfect design in the Hallmark card family. And always the Hallmark on the back of every card you mail says you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to Lionel Barrymore in the second act of Young Mr. Disraeli, starring Joseph Cotton. of London have told the death of William IV, and now a new ruler sits upon the throne of England, a slender girl of 18, Victoria. It's a summer's evening in the year 1837. In a fashionable parlor in Grosvenor Gate, Mary Lewis sits quietly listening to her husband and young Benjamin Disraeli, who talks of the coming general election. 
really dizzy, you mustn't stand on the sidelines. Get in it, man. Perhaps I've been in it too often already, Wyndham. Oh, will you listen to him, Mary? I mean it. I've stood for Parliament four times now, and four times taken the drubbing. And each time, Dizzy, you've come out the better for it. You've come before the public, that's what counts. The papers have reported your speeches, praised them, and denounced them. <laughs> Why, you're in a fair way of becoming a public issue yourself. Now is your time, Dizzy. Act. I'm sorry, Wyndham. Tonight... Well, this is one of my low moods. <laughs> I wonder how many times you and Mary have pulled me out of the doldrums in the past five years. It must be a bore, I'm sure. We understand you, Dizzy. Even a future prime minister is entitled to his gloom. Oh, please, Mary, don't remind me of that. I shall never cease to, my dear, because one day you shall be. When the country is ready for you, the queen will call you. Ah, the queen. It's a long, heartbreaking struggle to gain her smile. For that matter, any woman's smile. And yet that's exactly what you need, Dizzy. For a long time, I've been intending to prescribe the cure. The one sure remedy for your low moods. What is that? A wife. A, a wife? You're lonely, Dizzy. You need a companion. Do you have anyone in, in mind? No. But there are scores of women who have you in mind. Oh, now look here, Dizzy. I'm not going to let you off. We need you in Parliament, and if you say the word, we can campaign together. Well, that's tempting enough. Only you would be that generous, Wyndham. Well, well, will you do it? Where? Ah, Maidstone. The borough is electing two members, and we could go in together. But I still need an issue, something I believe in and can fight for. Oh, Dizzy, what a poor memory you have. What was your last speech? Mm, uh, was, oh, yes, yes, against the poor law. Exactly. The poor law. That's it. The cruelty of sending the poor to prison for their debts. The degradation of helpless human beings. If there's to be reform, let it begin with the forgotten people. Wyndham, I'm with you. Thank you, Dizzy. And thank you, Mary. Tonight, my dear, I think you've given us a new member of Parliament. Yes, I'm almost sure of it. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker! The Honorable Member from Maidstone, Mr. Disraeli. Mr. Speaker, in this my first speech before this honorable body... Gentlemen. Gentlemen, I wish to reply to Mr. O'Connell's previous remark. I just can't believe it. The House of Commons has never treated anyone so. Well, I was there, my dear. Dizzy isn't exaggerating. Oh, it's a nightmare. They never heard a word I said. They hated me on sight. But why? Why? Perhaps because they fear you, Dizzy. Fear me? Wyndham's right. You came to Parliament with a reputation already made. You've written books, you've spoken before crowds, and bent them to your will. The House of Commons doesn't like that. It wants to think that you will learn from it, Dizzy. Not it, from you. They'll listen to me yet. I'll, I'll make them listen. Yes, but not that way, Dizzy. The next time you speak, be like them. Be as dull as your listeners, and before long, they'll beg you to be different again. They'll beg you to be Disraeli. <laughs> my sister Sarah said something like that to me a long time ago. Women understand these things instinctively, my dear. Isn't that so, Wyndham? I, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I've often said that... I... Huh? What does? I... What's the matter? Oh, it's nothing, my dear. I just, it was a hard day. I, I've overstrained myself again. I, I must sit down. Wyndham, perhaps some brandy. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I, oh. Wyndham. Oh, he, he's fainted. I hope it's only that. I'll fetch the doctor. My dear Mary, words cannot express my sympathy. I know your loss because it is mine too. We have lost our dearest friend. Dear Sarah, there is a lady, the recent widow of Wyndham Lewis, 
who needs the peace and healing comfort of a stay in the country, I ask that you and father and mother invite her down and take her to your hearts. Dear Mary, of course I shall be down to see you. Sarah writes me that you are growing restless and it's time that you should be. It's time also that you return to London and to the friends who miss you. Come in, Hester. <laughs> I've been called many names in my career, but never Hester. Dizzy. Don't move. Just stand there in the day window with the sunlight streaming in on you. Now, a, a bit more profile. Don't, don't look out the window. Oh, you silly. I'm watching for the royal procession. The queen is riding to Kensington. Mary, you've never looked lovelier. Those dark circles under the eyes, what happened to them? Gone. Thanks to the wonderful care of your wonderful family. But not thanks to my weekend visits. In my vanity, I thought that you brightened considerably whenever I appeared. Oh, not is it? I know. It's London again. Callers, parties, the social now, world. Now, you know that's not true. I hardly ever go out. It's time that you must. Wyndham would want you to. Life is waiting for you. And love. Oh, I, I think they're coming now. Who? Uh, the procession. Queen. Uh, Mary, uh, don't find excuses. Don't put me off. We've got to face what's happened to us. When it happened and how, I'm not sure. But suddenly I discovered I was in love with you. And I hope, I believe, you are with me. No, Dizzy, no, we can't. <laughs> My dear, I abolished that word long ago. Dizzy, there's been talk already. If you haven't heard it, I have. What kind of talk? Well, that, that because Wyndham helped you... You want to take care of his widow as a debt of honor. Oh, if that's all people can say. No, but there's more. That you want to marry Wyndham's money. And that I'm older than you. A silly widow running after her youth. Mary. Mary, you don't care about gossip, however ugly. If you love me. I do, Dizzy. With all my heart. Well, that's all in the world that matters. Oh, no, don't you see, my dear? If we marry, we convince everyone that the stories are true. The talk will never die. I see. I understand. Do you really? I understand that the woman I love has grown young and beautiful again because of that love and that she turns away from it a coward. I am. I am. But not a few things. A coward before the vicious gossip of idle tongues. Very well. And live your empty life to please others. Cast me off and go alone to your grave as I will. But remember, remember to your dying day one man whose honest love was poured upon sand. Dizzy. Goodbye. Oh, Dizzy! Dizzy, come back. Please come back. I was wrong. Mary. Oh, my darling. I thought I could go on without you. I thought I had to for your sake. You're going to be a great man, my dearest. And I didn't want our love to be the tool of your enemy. If I'm great, Mary, it'll be because of you. No rumor, no lie can ever change that. Let there be enemies. I've won you. And now I can win everything. Lizzie. Listen. Here, I'll open the window. There she is. It's the queen. Yes, my dear. And she's looking up. She's smiling at us. followed, Queen Victoria looked up often to Benjamin Disraeli and smiled fondly and gratefully at the man who had made her Empress of India and became, at long last, her favorite the Prime Minister.
Cotton and Lionel Barrymore will return in a moment. Probably one of the nicest things about Christmas is that it just seems much easier at Christmas to tell someone we like them. For instance, the people we see every day at work or those we do business with throughout the year. That's undoubtedly why so many businessmen send Christmas cards. It isn't a matter of business, it's a gesture of friendship. And that's why so many businessmen are welcoming the news that this year there is a special collection of Hallmark Christmas cards especially designed for the businessman. These cards are all assembled in one Hallmark album called the Hallmark Christmas Card Album for Men. Among the many designs you'll find in this book, you businessmen are sure to find the Christmas card you want to represent you and your company. Represent you with dignity, with friendliness, with good taste. There are some designs where you can have a choice of several different greetings. Or you can word your own Christmas message, and it will be printed to order for you at the same time your name is being imprinted. You'll find this Hallmark album for men at any of the fine stores that feature Hallmark cards. And you can be sure that any Christmas card you select from this album will be the kind of card you'll be proud to send. Because by ordering Hallmark Christmas cards, you'll know that every person receiving one from you will see that Hallmark on the back and know immediately that you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is Lionel Barrymore. Joe Cotton, it was a great treat to have you with us on Hallmark Playhouse tonight. Thank you for an excellent performance. I'm very glad you invited me, Lionel. I especially enjoyed portraying the earlier part of the life of Disraeli. Incidentally, I notice you often select stories of great people. Oh, yes, 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 sure we do. Yes. Particularly those whose faith and courage have inspired others. I think that's why I've always enjoyed Hallmark Playhouse. It's also probably one of the reasons I enjoy sending and receiving Hallmark cards. They're a simple and sincere way to send a message of encouragement. Now, what story have you chosen for next week, Lionel? Well, now, next week on Hallmark Playhouse, we're going to present our dramatization of Sir Walter Scott's great narrative poem, The Lady of the Lake. And our guest star will be the charming Joan Fontaine. <laughs> our Hallmark Playhouse is every Sunday. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our story tonight was adapted by Leonard St. Clair. Until Sunday then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Joseph Cotton will soon be seen in the 20th Century Fox release, The Steel Trap. The role of Mary Ann was played by Lorene Tuttle and Virginia Gregg was Sarah. Others in the cast were Ben Wright as Wyndham Lewis, Hans Conrad as Edward Bulwer, Ted DeCorsia as Maples, and John Dodsworth as Lord Melbourne. Every Sunday, Hallmark Cards present two great programs for the whole family's enjoyment. On radio, the Hallmark Playhouse with host Lionel Barrymore. And on television, outstanding dramatic entertainment on the Hallmark Television Theater. Consult your paper for time and station. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at this same time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Joan Fontaine in Sir Walter Scott's Lady of the Lake. And the week following, Fletcher Pratt's Prebles Boys, starring McDonald Carey. And the week after that, Claude M. Puse's Daniel Webster on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.